Our next speaker, I think, uh, has presented the greatest pronunciation challenge of the, uh, of the day. Uh, please welcome Brad Grzyziak. Uh First, I'd like to start off and um, thank everyone at Sauce Labs for uh, putting this on, for uh, getting me here. Uh, they did a great job in, in making that happen. So uh, a uh, round of applause for them. My name uh, is Brad Grzyziak. I'm co-founder of Vendyworks, a uh, Ruby on Rails iOS and closure consulting shop in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I got my slides online, and I'm going to talk about Vulkan today. Um, and I'm not really going to talk too much about how to use Vulkan, but why you should use something like Vulkan. Um, but before that, um, I'd like to uh, introduce every audience uh, that I, I give a talk to, to something that they wouldn't necessarily be uh, introduced to. Uh, within the realm of what the conference is about. Uh, so uh, instead of testing, I'm going to start off talking about a gentle introduction to the finite difference method approach to the Navier-Stokes equations for computational uh, fluid dynamics. Thank you. Uh, so first I'm going to start off, I'm going to try to do this in three minutes. Uh, start the timer. Uh, first, uh, some notation. If you see a subscript, that means I'm taking the partial derivative of the large letter to, uh, in respect to the small letter. Uh, for example, if you have x, which is position in the x direction, subscript t, that means I'm taking partial of x with respect to t, also known as horizontal velocity, u. Uh, if you see something in bold, that means it's a vector. In our case, it's going to be a five-element vector because we're going to be solving continuity, three momentum equations, and the energy equation. Uh, this is the Navier-Stokes equations for the, uh, the finite difference method. Um, and it's in respect to time and the three spatial dimensions. But we don't always want to uh, compute things in a nice cube in x, y, and z, although the computer will like to. For example, if you're studying a cylinder in an uh, internal combustion engine, you might want to use cylindrical uh, coordinates. And so you'd use the transformation for that. Maybe you're looking at uh, an explosion. You'd want to use uh, spherical coordinates for that. Uh, maybe you have a large volume and you want to uh, analyze a very specific part of that. You'd use rectangular prisms, but pinch it towards that uh, area of interest. But generally, we don't care about what the actual transformation is. We just want to have a transformation. So we're going to use C, eta, and zeta as our general coordinate system. And they don't necessarily have to be orthogonal to each other. So our Navier-Stokes equations have been transformed into this. Uh, th in this case, the subscripts do not mean partial with respect to 1, because that would be weird. Uh, so we take those, those four vectors at the top, remember they're bold, so they're vectors, and we transform them uh, through this transformation. Uh, so we have C, it is zeta, x, y, z, and this new thing called J. J is the Jacobian, which is the determinant of the partial derivative matrix. Um, and E, F, and G uh, will split into two different parts, the inviscid part and the viscous part. Um, and now we have this glorious expanded uh, equation. So let's dive into what each one of these things mean. Um, the, the U is what, what would be considered the conserved variables. If you have a tube and you're flowing water through it, you need to make sure that the, um, the molecules going in one end come out at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the other end in the same amounts. Um, otherwise, you're building up molecules inside the tube, and it just um, that bad things will happen. So you, you have uh, rho, which is density, u, v, and w, which are uh, velocities in x, y, and z, and e sub t, again, a subscript, but we're not going to be taking partial derivative of t on this one. So uh, rho, uh, if you remember back to high school chemistry, can be solved uh, for t and pressure using Boyle's law. That's only if you're using an ideal gas, uh, but if you're not, so you can use something like van der Waals. Uh, e sub t is thermal and kinetic energy. E sub t is a function of temperature. And again, we have u, v, and w. All right, so we've got fluxes. Uh, nothing new here. These are all the same letters that we saw before. This is in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. We also have uh, viscous fluxes. We have a new term here, tau. That's going to be our stress tensor. And we also have a q. So this is in, again, the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So uh, tau, like I said, is a stress tensor. And if the subscripts are equal, that means it's an axial or compressive or rarefying uh, stress. And uh, we only have one new term in here, and that's viscosity. Viscosity tends not to change too much with a fluid, unless it's a liquid, uh, slightly dependent on temperature. Uh, we've got y direction and z direction. And then we have our shear stresses as well. Nothing new in this one. Finally, we have the heat equations. Uh, on the left, we have Fourier's law, of course, which, uh, which uses K, uh, the thermal conductivity. We've got some more T's, and then on the right is the mass diffusion. 
uh, C sub I is going to be the specific heat, H is the enthalpy, and U is the mass diffusion rate as determined by Fick's law. What are we left with? U, V, W, P, and T. Velocities in three directions, pressure and temperature. This is something we can understand, all being jammed into this giant equation. Also, we might have species concentrations. If you're burning stuff, you might have oxygen, hydroxyl, hydrogen, hydrocarbons, <laughs> nitri nitrogen, etc. So we take all, uh, all these things, put them together, we sum over all the points in our volume, and then we iterate over time, and boom, we have a rocket. Thank you. If you have any questions, we have a party afterwards. <laughs> so, Boken, hopefully like your minds right now. Um, Boken was an open source, uh, is an open source project that a coworker and I wrote, uh, James Waters and I. And uh, when you write an open source project, you uh, tend to follow it, see what people are saying about it. So I have a consistent or a, uh, a persistent column in TweetDeck open uh, monitoring Twitter. This is a terrible name for a project if you're going to be monitoring Twitter for this because you run into things like this. My phony was all broken. That's why I didn't reply, ha ha. Not sure how they got three E's in there. This person is a little sadder. Uh, I cannot answer your tweet right now. I'm in floods of tears. My heart is broken. And then they say LOL. I don't think that word means what you think it means. And also that emoticon, it's like a stack of people looking at someone frowning. Um, but you do run into some gems, like this one. Tony Womo out for three to four weeks with broken widow thingy. Uh, it's, it's an actual Onion uh, uh, article. So what is Boken? A Boken, uh, Boken is a testing tool that combines Apple's UI automation framework with CoffeeScript in the command line. Yes. Love those things. So uh, when you do uh, UI automation, there are, there are two things that, uh, or, sorry. Um, when you're doing testing, I, I like to uh, relate back to my previous life as, surprise, surprise, an aerospace engineer. Um, so, uh, in, the, in the engineering field, you, you, you do part testing and you'd use finite element analysis, FEA on that, and that's equivalent to our unit tests. You'd also do assembly testing, so uh, put some parts together and see how they react when you push on them. Um, and again, you'd use uh, FEA and computational fluid dynamics on that. And we would consider that functional testing. Next, we do verification testing. So that's put the whole thing together and see how it works, not necessarily a sub-assembly. Again, we'd use FEA or CFD, and we would consider those integration tests. And finally, we'd have validation, which is unfortunately done most often with things like Excel. And that's basically saying, we made 10,000 widgets. How are they doing? Um, and in our world, that's usually going to be load and performance. We're going to throw a bunch of requests at this application, whether it's a web application or a native application, and see how it fares. So what does UI automation do? Um, it can do two things. It can assert behavior, so it, it, says, it can tell you when you press this or tap that, uh, you should get a certain result. The other cool thing about UI automation is that it allows you to automate other instruments. So for example, you get a bug report like this. I love cow clicker. Does everyone remember cow clicker? It's kind of a social experiment. You click a cow, and then you wait out eight hours, and then you click it again. Um, Thank you, there, but there's a problem. I click the cow, and I, and I know I can't click it for another eight hours, but I did anyway, a bunch of times, like a thousand, and then it crashed. Uh, this, is a, this is a good bug report because you don't usually get this much information, but you don't want to sit there and, and tap the thing a thousand times to see what's happening. So UI automation lets you run an automated test that you know, taps it a thousand times alongside a memory leak or a memory alloc instrument to see where the, the hotspots of your program are. Maybe you're sending some data off to uh, an analytics server and uh, you're not releasing some memory, for example. So uh, Boken doesn't do that part. Uh, Boken actually focuses on these middle two parts, uh, the functional in integration tests. Um, so let's, let's take a look at some of the technology under the covers. Uh, UI automation, like I mentioned before. This is what Apple puts at the top of their documentation. Um, and I won't read it to you out loud uh, because it's only partially true, um, because they say it works when your app is running on a connected device. That's true. It also runs on a simulator, which is very uh, useful. Uh, so what does this UI automation JavaScript reference API look like? We have, we have a bunch of uh, classes that we can talk to, or objects, I guess, in, in JavaScript being a prototypical language. We have UIA target. UIA target is the, um, the 
device or simulator that you are running the application on. It's the system under test. You have UI application, which is the application running on the target. You have UIA host, which was uh, mentioned before how you can run commands on your local machine. UIA host is the, the, the laptop or the, the, the desktop that you're running the, the tests from. You have UIA logger, which I'll get into in a little bit, lets you log passes, failures, debug statements, et cetera. You have UIA element, which is effectively NS object. Um, it's your standard element. Uh, you have UIA element array, which is an enumerable of UIA elements, but it's slightly more powerful than just a standard array of things. And there's a lot more. I suggest you look into the, the documentation. It's okay. It's mediocre documentation. There's things like uh, sliders, uh, text areas, text fields, labels, etc. But it's extremely low level. Uh, so you'd want to use something else um, on top of it. And so the thing that I recommend, and it's not necessarily part of the Boken uh, package, but it's definitely in the ecosystem of things you want to use with Boken, and that's TuneUp.js. <coughs> and there's the GitHub uh, location for it. Uh, so let's take a look at what UI, UI automation provides as far as assertion goes, or rather maybe lack thereof. Uh, in UI automation, you, you, can say, you can tell it that you're starting a test, and then you do some stuff, and then you finish the test, either with a, a pass, a failure, or an issue, an issue being that there was an exception thrown. Rather than saying A does not equal B, it was the whole thing blew up, and I don't know what happened. Um, so let's look at an actual implementation of what would it, what would it take to actually use these UIA loggers to, to, to do a reasonable thing uh, for assertions. It would look something like this. You'd set a title, ensure foo, um, set a target window, you'd start the test, uh, you'd do some testing, and then at the end of the try block, you'd, you'd call a pass, um, it, and you'd catch any exception. Those exceptions might be failures or issues, um, and you'd check that. If there are any grammar fascists in the room, yes, I did mean ensure, because I didn't tell you this is an insurance application. So uh, if you use TuneUp.js, your test look like this, which is a huge improvement. Um, we're not actually doing any assertions in here, uh, but we are testing for errors. So for example, if uh, getting the get insurance button returns nil, we're going to call tap on nil, and, um, and it'll throw an error. So we'll, we'll see that as a failure. There are many other things that TuneUp gives you, uh, things like assert true, assert false, assert equals. Uh, you can unequivocally fail. You can do some string manipulations like trimming. Um, you can wait till something is visible. Uh, these are things that UI automation does not give you out of the box. And you can type a string using the keyboard. Um, so that's uh, a, an <coughs> overview of, of TuneUp. The other thing that, uh, one of the other things that Boken uses significantly, and, and it's really the value add for me, and it's the reason why Boken was born in the first place, is CoffeeScript. I hate JavaScript. Really hate JavaScript, and here's why. Um, this is these are two books. The top one is the good parts of JavaScript, and, or JavaScript the good parts, and the bottom one is the definitive guide. Let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, the red part is ostensibly the good stuff. Um, the black stuff, I don't know. It must be like this is how you avoid all these pitfalls in JavaScript. That's probably what all that is. So I, I really dislike JavaScript. Um, I like the red parts, the good parts. Those are, those are actually really kind of good, kind of nice. But so, what does CoffeeScript look like? CoffeeScript is is a little language that compiles down to JavaScript, and that's actually taken verbatim from the CoffeeScript site. A little language that co compiles down to JavaScript. So it looks something like this. Already, it's solving a problem. If you don't put the var in there, do you do you know what happens? It becomes a global variable. This is terrible behavior. This is one of the many pitfalls of JavaScript. But CoffeeScript takes care of that for you. If you just say foo equals one, it'll put in the var statement for you. Next in CoffeeScript, you might define some functions. And so we define square as, um, you know, it takes one argument x, and the result is x times x. Pretty simple. We're going to create a math object. And each line is going to be a different property inside that math object. We're going to define root, cube, and square. Pretty simple. And on the right, you can see what the result is going to be in JavaScript. Um, you can easily write that, but why wouldn't you want to write the CoffeeScript instead? 
Uh, you can do things like splats, um, var variable argument lists in, in Objective-C speak. Um, that's a lot simpler than what you have on the right with JavaScript. Uh, CoffeeScript gives you so much power, like, like complex list comprehensions. I don't want to do this in JavaScript. I, I'm defining an array, array called foods. Um, I'm going to define a function called eat, which just calls om.nom on the, on the f that's passed in. And then what I'm going to do is, for every food in foods, when that food isn't chocolate, I'm going to eat that food. You can do it in, in one line. Um, I had to wrap it here just for uh, getting it on the slides, though. So just one line, and you, and you can have this very complicated thing that, that reads really well. Next up, you can soak up, soak up nulls and undefines. Uh, when you start introducing nulls and undefines accidentally into your JavaScript code, bad things happen. And they are treated differently, so you have to test for one or the other. There's no one way to test for both of them simultaneously and not have some edge cases where, where other bad things happen. And, and finally, classes. Um, you can actually define classes in CoffeeScript. Uh, JavaScript is prototypical, so, um, and that, that, that's, that's an actual computer science-y term, prototypical. So you're, you're um, basically birthing objects from other objects. Um, and a lot of us are, are used to uh, class-oriented languages. So CoffeeScript uh, provides that to you as well. And the at, simply enough, uh, just inserts a, a this dot into there, so that's kind of nifty. So why would you use CoffeeScript? Um, the most important parser for any code is another human being, whether a teammate or your future self. And that was said by me right now, um, inspired by others, of course. So what would it look like to use CoffeeScript with UI automation? Well, it would look something like this. Uh, we're going to define a singleton object. So that, that top line is a, a bit difficult to parse, but we're going to instantiate an anonymous class that inherits from screen. And we're going to assign that to a variable called favorites. Um, we capitalize F because it's a singleton. Why not? And then we have four methods on that favorites object. We have a table that calls out to my app, which is a, a global object maybe. Um, and we, call, we have a favorite named, a tap favorite named, and an assert favorite named. And then uh, our tests would look something like this. This is very readable. Um, I tweeted this earlier. I, I'm not a huge fan of, of Gherkin, um, actually, which is the, the language that, that you frequently see, in, uh, see called as cucumber. Uh, when you're taking English and compiling it down via regexes or just regular old uh, string matching into code, I'm not a huge fan. I've, I've been down that road. I'm a Rubyist. <laughs> I drank that Kool-Aid for a very long time. Um, and I think this code is more expressive than your standard cucumber uh, steps. But that's just me. Do what you will. But what we can see here, again, insurance app. Uh, we've got some policies. Uh, we're going to mark something as favorite. Uh, maybe we have a policy named 80 slash 10. Um, and we're going to flip to the favorites uh, screen. And then we're going to assert that there's a favorite named 80 slash 10. And that's all it is. Um, so the last piece of the puzzle for Boken is something called Rake, which is Ruby's uh, version of Make. Um, and using Rake is pretty easy. Um, you just call Rake-T to see all the tasks that are available for you to do. And this works with any time you use Rake. Um, and here we can finally see Boken um, with only a few more slides left in my presentation. Um, but uh, so these are all the, the different tasks that you can use with, with Rake. And um, the, the reason that, that I think a lot of people are, are glomming on to Boken is because of this. Oh, well, there it is. It's on GitHub. First, it's, someone said this to me. It's the first automation library I've wanted to use as it doesn't require hacking my Objective-C project to pieces to make it work. That doesn't mean it's the only one that does this. I know there are some other uh, projects out there that, that don't. Uh, require you to actually modify your code. I think the, the previous um, presentation uh, d does that as well. But this is, this is actually kind of a big deal. So uh, using Woken is as simple as just issuing a rake. So you're at the command line and you just type rake inside of your, um, your application. You're going to have to install it. It's a pretty simple installation process. Once you have it in there, you just run rake. And what rake will do is, is compile your project 
using Xcode build. And you'll get a bunch of blue dots. And, and this, these colors are actually what you will see in the terminal. It's not all white, and I'm highlighting it for your benefit. This is what you'll actually see. And then hopefully, if you've done a good job, you'll see build successful. Uh, you don't have any compiler errors. And so after build successful, the uh, uh, Boken will take your copy script and compile it down into JavaScript. And, um, and then it will run that JavaScript in uh, instruments. And it will, uh, it will, on the fly, tell you as it's going what, what it's doing, whether it's starting a test, whether it's issuing a debug statement saying you've tapped something. And, and if you just run instruments from the command line uh, without any uh, of the benefits that Boken gives you, it gives you this much information. And it's really hard to parse as a human being. And so what Boken does is it th throws away the stuff that you don't need. Actually, it doesn't throw it away. It puts it into a log file for you. But it only displays the important parts. It highlights important parts. Tap, that's an important thing. Let's highlight it yellow. String, that's, that's kind of important to pluck out of this, uh, the screen. So we'll make it purple. Um, and then once it's done, you get a pass. And then immediately, it will start running the same test on the iPad. Um, and this is all done on the simulator. And the, the fun thing is, if you plug in your iPhone or your iPad or iDevice, iPad mini, i5, whatever, iPod touch, uh, it'll run it on that device. That's the UI for changing between simulator and device. You just plug it in. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's, how, that's what Boken is. And, and so here are some of the features. Um, it uses CoffeeScript. Huge win. The entire reason uh, that James and I wrote Boken in the first place so that we didn't have to write JavaScript. It's command line, uh, which I love because that lets you use it in continuous integration environments. And we've tweaked instruments that Apple provides so that it actually gives you back the right exit status. Thanks, Apple. You always return exit status zero. Not very useful. Um, it gives you filtered and colored output. It doesn't barf onto the screen with every debugging message ever. Um, Boken uh, trims that down. Um, it's compatible with instruments.app. So once you've run your Boken test, you can then take the results file and load it up in instruments and inspect what happened if, if something unexpected happened. Um, and it lets you write tests outside of instruments.app. Uh, app. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this, but if you run into some weird tabbing issues in the editor for uh, UI automation inside of instruments. So you're typing some code, and you tab, and like it does something weird with the tabbing, and you're like, oh, that's weird. I'm just going to keep typing. Thanks, Apple. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to redo all the, or undo all this. So you undo it, and then you think, oh, I want to redo it, get it back. Um, it screws up. It screws up badly. You end up with gibberish. Basically, it loses place of where all the cursors are during the undo and redo cycle, and so you just get nothing. Like it's just characters everywhere. It's terrible. So. That's a nice thing about Boken. You don't have to write inside of the instruments. And finally, it lets you run on uh, the device or the simulator, like I said. So Boken, um, what it does is you know, it, it assembles these known primitives, CoffeeScript, um, real implementation of instruments, not, not subverting it, uh, Ruby and Rake. Um, and, it and it puts those things together into a very useful tool. Perhaps maybe kind of like how the Navier-Stokes equation takes those five things and gives you a great tool. But thank you. Um, there's my information. The slides are on uh, bw.cm. It's our shortener. Don't put an O in there, slash mobile summit. And then um, the, the project's homepage is there at uh, GitHub. How, how, how's the documentation for Broken? Because uh, when I first did some research on automation tools, um, I was looking at Zucchini, I guess, in the early stages. And there was very little documentation, so it was very hard to figure out mm -hmm. how to use it. Uh, it's probably in the same state that you, you found it. Uh, the, the trick to Boken is that there's not much to it. Um, it just pieces together some other parts. And so um, there's installing Ruby, which most people have already. Um, if they follow your, that is on C, right? If they follow your blog post, then they can even get a newer version of Ruby. Um, and then it's the, the installation instructions are on the website, and you basically just run rake. Um, and um, actually, I think probably since you've looked at it, uh, we've added a new task which is Vulkan in it, and that will set up the fi uh, folder structure that you need uh, for Vulkan to run properly, rather than like looking at the website and MKDIRing on your own. So 
that'll do it to, for you. Uh, it, it doesn't need that much documentation, I don't think. Um, but if, if there's a lot of people out there, or even just a few that, that are asking for more documentation, I'd be more than happy to, to do that. Also, I'm not going to ask for people for hiring them, but I will ask for collaborators. Um, I, I do love this project, but uh, my time is limited, so um, I try to get to it when I can. So collaborators, uh, pull requests as well, very welcome. I think you might have covered this in your talk, but how awesome is CoffeeScript? Uh, words cannot express <laughs> how awesome CoffeeScript is. I only showed you a small, minute part of what CoffeeScript really gives you. Um, things like uh, in JavaScript, the double equals. You should never, ever, ever be writing double equals in JavaScript because it does crazy things. In CoffeeScript, when you write double equals, it will automatically give you a triple equals, which is probably what you mean. Um, and the list just goes on. I think it's coffeescript.org for the homepage for that. Are you familiar with LiveScript? With who? LiveScript. Live Sprint? Live Script. Live Script. No. It's sort of LiveScript is to CoffeeScript as CoffeeScript is to JavaScript. OK. <laughs> And I, and I recommend you take a look at it. Okay. And, and, and the name collision, for those of you who have been around for a while, with the original Netscape 2.0 version of what is now JavaScript, is an intentional joke. <laughs> um, one other thing that we might uh, go off and do for, uh, for Boken is add ClojureScript compatibility. We've got a few Clojureans at, at the office, so they might be interested in doing that as well. ClojureScript, Clojure to JavaScript, as you might presume. Any more questions? All right. All right thank you. Let's have a hand for Brad.